let's ask a big question about national security, because uh, aren't we seeing a shift from Eurocentric uh, American foreign policy following upon the Second World War and uh, the, the end of the Cold War, although what is the uh, role of Russia now, and the turn to Asia. Uh, North Korea, that little puny country, has so much power over us. And China, the giant, you're saying, is the opposite number now. You're right. There is a long-term shift. It's, I mean, very long-term. In a way, we're moving back to pre-1500, if we can wrap our heads around that. In other words, an era where the, Europe has been the center of the world. Even during the Cold War, Germany was kind of the ultimate prize, right? Now we're in a world where Europe is really secondary. It really, really is, actually. The this, this center of gravity has shifted to the Pacific. And China, it's just the sheer uh, weight of China's economy is pulling everybody in, and it's creating security challenges for the US, too, particularly as China converts that into political and military weight. So that's the number one long-term challenge, which in an odd way, I mean, Trump seems to believe on some level, right? Which is that we need to focus away from, and Obama did something similar, the pivot to Asia. So we're sort of fumbling toward this sense. I mean, Americans kind of have this feeling that China is now the number one challenge. It's not that people want to go to war with China, and China doesn't want to go to war with the US, but this is the number one challenge. So I think you're right. We're, we're moving toward a world where um, it's going to be more Asia-centric, more Pacific-centered. Uh, that's frustrating for Europhiles and <laughs> Atlanticists, right? And it's not to say that Europe isn't still a key center for American activity in the world, and the Middle East is a sort of third theater. But um, that's part of the challenge for what people call the liberal order, is how do you manage a liberal order when the single biggest actor in the Asia-Pacific is not liberal? <laughs> I mean, China plays by its own rules. It's not going to play by our rules. They've made that very clear. And they have the power to resist and say, no, we'll, we'll, we'll push back. We'll play by our own rules. Massive industrial espionage, intellectual property theft, right? Uh, territorial aggression in the nearby waters. Um, you know, China can be pretty aggressive, even though it doesn't want open conflict with the US. And that's, that's probably not going to go away. That'll be a challenge for whoever is president. So I have a slightly different view than Colin on this one, which is I think it's still an open question uh, whether China can continue to rise without liberalizing um, and whether we are really willing to shift our interests to Asia. So let me take the two of them um, separately. First, so uh, there has never been a country that has succeeded in becoming sustainably prosperous without becoming politically liberal, right? It, it's Hegel's philosophy in action, that as people be, have their basic needs met, they become more demanding political consumers. Uh, and China is, of course, the great outlier to that, because for the last 40 years, they have been becoming more and more prosperous, and there doesn't appear to be any uh, important alternative power center arguing for liberalization. Um, the space I would watch, I am watching, and I encourage you to watch about how this plays out, is that I think what is going to force the liberalization of the Chinese government is moms demanding safe baby milk. Right? Because in an authoritarian society where power is concentrated so tightly at the top and there are none of the canary in the coal mine mechanisms that free societies have, investigative journalists, local government demanding this federal government do its job right, elections. Hong Kong has just put limits on the number of mainland Chinese who can transit into Hong Kong because they are buying all the safe baby milk because people on mainland China have no confidence that their government is keeping their food safe, right? That's a classic rich world complaint. And you see Chinese begin to act like demanding political consumers in the ways that are possible for them. So, so I'm reasonably confident that the Chinese government is, if it is going to grow more prosperous, will also be forced by by Chinese themselves to grow more liberal. Mm -hmm. The second thing, but, but it's a great social science experiment we are running. The second thing is that 
Per capita GDP in China is seven thousand. Excuse me, is eight thousand seven hundred forty-eight dollars, which is fantastic, but it's the rough equivalent of Equatorial Guinea. Um, it's not the equivalent of South Korea. It's not the equivalent of Japan. It's not the equivalent of Germany. Um, so China has been a magnificent manufacturing base uh, for ex precisely the kind of thing that has put my Uncle Eddie out of a job as a United Auto worker, right? They are, they are the manufacturing base of the world right now. As Colin points out, they have, they have not been stewards of that in a way that is encouraging Apple computers to, to manufacture things in China. So you begin to see the ebbing away of international investment, especially in the kinds of air services and high up the value chain kind of production that drives the G7 economies. So whether China can get through this middle income trap uh, without, without um, all of the rest of us stopping to help them, is actually a second open question. And the third very good question you raise is, but Europe, does, we have had the luxury of not caring about Europe because after the end of the Cold War, it was the world's safest place. And, and that is less true at the moment, given Vladimir Putin's behavior. And you begin to see, so for all of President Trump's angry, anti-European, you have seen greater investment militarily, greater investment financially in the security of Europe by the United States in the last 18 months because we can afford to ignore Europe and pivot to Asia if Europe's stable and secure. But too much for us in terms of the people we like in the world and in terms of the thrumming of the American economy actually requires a stable, prosperous Europe. So we are now slightly recalibrating, and I think you'll see more of that. And also Europeans are recalibrating, right? Every NATO ally in the last two and a half years has turned the corner and is now increasing its defense spending again, because they're nervous too. And five NATO allies have, uh, are putting brigades of troops into the Baltic states because we're worried enough about Russian behavior. Mm -hmm.